Welcome to worship to both those in person and online as we celebrate All Saints Sunday. The first reading this morning is from uh, 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in turn, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sins is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. <clears throat> the second reading today is from Matthew 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word of God. Good morning. I think that means my mic is on, right? Okay. Will you take a moment and pray with me? Oh God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh Lord, are our rock and our strength and our redeemer. We ask your guidance in Jesus' name. Amen. This passage that we just heard is fairly well known. I would say very well known. It's referred to as the Beatitudes. And that word derives its meaning from the blessings that are listed, not as a part of an attitude, as the word might sound. But I kind of like to think of them uh, as attitudes of being. Being what God wants me to be, being my truest expression of myself, being true to God's calling. It's helpful to know that in this context, blessed can mean happy, which can sound kind of funny. Happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn. But let's take a little closer look. Many of the qualities that Jesus lift up, lifts up here are ones that may be considered negative in some way, but Jesus shows us how they are positive. Like many of his teachings, he turns the, the accepted way of thinking about things around for a whole new perspective. In verse 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I have read that humility is a close approximation for poor in spirit here, and that make, make, might make it easier to understand this verse. 
Jesus often spoke about being humble. He spoke of putting others first. He said the last shall be first. And he said that we shouldn't assume a position of high status. He asked his followers to put other people's needs first. And he demonstrated by washing the disciples' feet how to serve one another. Humility also requires that we not assume that we are right and that we have all the answers, that we can accomplish everything or even anything all on our own. When biology says, me first, humility says, you first. When our ego says, I did that, humility said, God did that through you. When self-centeredness says, I am somehow better than that next person, humility says, I have no idea what they're going through, so I had better not judge. When we see someone acting humbly, we may think that they will be taken advantage of. But Jesus says that they are blessed. When we practice humility for ourselves, we are blessed to know that we have found the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Those who mourn are happy? Well, they mourn because they've lost something. A loved one, maybe. But before we can lose something, we have to have had it in the first place. And that could be the source of this blessing. Happy is the person who had a loving relationship in their life, or relationships. Happy are those who felt the nurture of a parent, the love of a spouse, the hope or the promise of a child. Happy are those who've known the support of a brother or a sister or the encouragement of a close friend. These are immeasurable blessings because it's in these relationships that we find our deepest strength. Their loss causes immense grief. But the comfort is in having had them in the first place. So blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Verse 5 says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is like humility, but it kind of takes it a step further by adding obedience to God and to God's timing for things. To be meek is to accept that things don't always happen when we want them to or in the manner in which we want them to. And to accept that God is in charge and that's okay. The meek person doesn't try to run the show because they know that God already does. The meek person asks God to use them in whatever capacity God deems necessary to do God's will on earth. The meek person prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, rather than telling God what needs to be done. The meek person follows God's call even when they can't see where the path leads because they trust that God knows better than they do. So blessed are the meek. They will inherit the earth. The next verse Verse 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Thirsting for righteousness could mean a few different things. In my opinion, it, it could mean trying to do the right thing, but I think there might be more to it than that. I try to do the right thing all the time, but I don't always feel filled or that I can check off that box. Perhaps it's more about seeing, ju seeking justice in the world, trying to right wrongs, combating oppression or injustice where we find it, leveling the playing field where we can, nudging the world, or at least our small corner of it, ever so slightly in the direction that leads towards God's will and away from chaos. That can be very fulfilling even when the job isn't completely done. 
but you know, some small gain has been made. I know that it can be frustrating when we see so much suffering in the world and we know that our efforts are infinitesimally small in comparison to the need. But if we allow ourselves to trust that our efforts combined with those of others do make a difference and may influence others to seek righteousness, we fill ourselves to try again even when we fail or when we're unaware of the good that we've done. Notice that Jesus didn't say, blessed are those who achieve righteousness. I find comfort in that. Those who, he said, those who hunger and thirst for it. It's the act of pursuing righteousness, not the belief that we have attained it that brings the blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Being merciful is more than an act of benevolence. It's a whole different outlook. Acting merciful benefits the one on the receiving end of the mercy, but being merciful can impact us just by the practice of it. In this way, mercy is kind of a BOGO. You know what a BOGO is? Buy one, get one free. Both the giver and the receiver benefit. Being merciful to others does two things. First, it acknowledges that situations are complicated. And a transgression might not be as simple as it seems. It brings with it an attitude of curiosity that wants to find out what caused someone to cause harm. It doesn't remove accountability, but it seeks to understand the situation more fully. It puts aside assumptions about intent or motivation and asks, how can this be prevented in the future? Mercy is very forward-looking. We also show mercy when we help others regardless of whether we believe they deserve it or not. Mercy takes the judgment part out of the formula when deciding to offer help to someone, like feeding the hungry or sending Christmas cards to inmates or providing meeting space for a 12-step group. We don't have to wait for someone to injure us to be merciful. We can look for opportunities to serve others that might just break a cycle that perpetuates violence in some way. We can be proactive in our mercy. The second benefit, and I would argue the more important one, is that being merciful shows gratitude for the mercy that we ourselves have received from God. When we're merciful to others, we mimic God's mercy. If we stop to ponder all the ways that God has been merciful to us throughout our lives, how can we not be motivated to at least try to follow that example? To fail to be merciful when we've been shown immense mercy is a level of disrespect I'm not fully comfortable with. Sometimes the person we need to show mercy to is ourselves. If we believe that God has been merciful to us, and we're not merciful to ourselves, aren't we basically saying that God is wrong? I don't, I don't want to say that. Blessed are the merciful. They will receive mercy. Verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. To get a better handle on pure in heart, I think we need to ponder the opposite. What's the opposite of pure in heart? Well, maybe it's impure in heart. What are some impurities that can taint our hearts? Things like envy, ambition, self-centeredness, greed. Just to name a few, these can contaminate the purity of our hearts. It's difficult to overcome all the temptations of the world, but knowing the importance of having a pure heart may help us avoid situations that add these artificial ingredients. 
to the organically pure heart that God would have us have. When I think of purity of heart, I have an an image of, um, you know, in the Olympics, the snow, uh, the skiers, and they, they do the slalom, you know, the race where they have to swish back and forth. I think of avoiding impurities, like being an Olympic slalom skier, going down the hill, constantly swerving and turning to avoid all the obstacles. Here comes greed, swerve to the left. Here comes self-centeredness, swerve to the right. Overcoming the temptations of life leads to a clear path to God, but it's not a one and done type of deal. When we overcome today's challenges, that just means we get to wake up tomorrow and find some new and exciting challenges to overcome. Swerve and avoid one gate, And you get to swerve and avoid the next one, and the next one, and the next one until the race is done. Yes, blessed are the pure in heart. They will see God. Verse 9 says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. You may recall in the story of Jesus' birth, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, The angel Gabriel comes and makes that great speech about to the shepherds, about a savior being born. And then, right after that, in two short verses, it says, suddenly a great company of heaven and hosts, heavenly hosts, appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. From the very moment of Jesus' birth, the message has been about two things, praising God and bringing peace. He often greeted people with the word shalom, which means peace. He often taught and demonstrated ways to work towards peace in the community, in relationships, and in oneself. And so it's not surprising to me that he would lift up peacemakers for a special status designation. To be called children of God is both a great honor and a tremendous responsibility. Notice that Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peaceful, but blessed are the peacemakers. Peace must be built one grain of sand at a time, one interaction, one situation, one system, one policy at a time. Parents, you ever have kids and you could, you could just say to them, play nice and, and that'll do it, right? No. Anybody who's been around children, teachers, parents, no, you can't just say play nice and that's enough. They need constant coaching and instruction to build responsibilities, build relationships, build skills and maintain those relationships that benefit themselves and others. And it's those relationships that will lead to good behavior, not strict adherence to the rules, because we know kids sometimes aren't so good with the rules. And the same concept translates to adults. When we build relationships with others, especially with those who differ from us in some way, we then we want to avoid harming them. We want to advocate for their well-being and validate them in the eyes of others around us. All of this is peace building. All of these one-on-one connections is a part of peace building. Peace talks, you know, between nations or armies, those get the headlines. But the real peace building happens on a much smaller scale. One person reaches out to another person, to another person, to another person, and it builds. If God is the ultimate peace bringer, then when we get involved, we are participating in the family business. And this is a business that I want to be a shareholder in. I don't need to be the CEO. That job is already taken. But I'm quite happy to have a workstation and a company ID and a business card. And, oh yes, work from home definitely is an option here. 
It's a family-owned business, but the good news is anyone can be adopted. Anyone can get, wait for it, a piece of the action. So yes, blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are, pers- who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. If we try to live out these at- attributes, we will probably take some flack for it. Maybe a lot of flack. We may be taken advantage of. Others may try to lead us away from these ways because our positive actions maybe make them look bad. If we offer mercy, we may hear complaints of unfairness. Seeking peace or justice might threaten an existing power structure. But all of these difficulties are blessings because they show us that we are on the right track. Maintaining the status quo might be an easier path, but the path to the kingdom of heaven may have some speed bumps and some slaloms to steer around. And we will surely stumble from time to time, but... It's a path worth taking anyway, if seeing the kingdom of heaven is the reward. So yes, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This section ends with verses 11 and 12, which say, Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice! And be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Across the ages, prophets have tried to lead people in the direction of God with mixed results. When we act as agents of good in the world, we follow in their footsteps. They may have been ignored, slandered, or even killed, but they persisted anyway. We're not doing a new thing here. We're joining a long line of people who have attempted to follow God's ways. Some received accolades. Many did not. I would probably be able to say most did not. We will never know most of their names, but I believe they made a difference. And God knows their names and how they helped God's kingdom come to earth. Each of these verses could be a whole basis for a sermon on its own. But when we take them together, the theme is to try to look at things in a new way to find the hidden blessings. This pleases God and brings a multitude of blessings to us and to the world. Amen? Amen.